This is a presentation about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's meant to be an instrument for ordinary people to be able to understand the conflict at last and to be able to act in a meaningful way to put a stop to it. Uh, because I'm deeply convinced that the reason why uh, the, that conflict is still raging is because Western public opinion um, is missing a huge chunk of history, a huge part of that story that is always carefully kept away from the media, from books, from, from public uh, uh, discussions about the, the conflict. And if people knew uh, that part of history, uh, they would be able to understand the conflict and, and finally to act meaningfully uh, with uh, their politicians to put pressure on, on the United States, on Israel, uh, on the, the Arab states to put a stop to the conflict. Um, now, let me introduce myself first. I'm uh, an Italian. Uh, my name is Paolo Barnard. I'm a senior foreign correspondent. I've been working for uh, many uh, Italian national newspapers, uh, above all for uh, Italian state television RAI, uh, the report and the educational uh, programs. The report program and the educational channel uh, programs. I'm also an author of uh, books on, on the Middle East uh, and the war on terror, uh, the latest of which uh, is this. Now, um, in order to explain to you uh, what is uh, missing uh, and why it's so uh, serious, uh, let me start with a metaphor. Follow me through a small, uh, simple metaphor. Just imagine that the French Revolution, that we all know, had been told uh, to generations in books, in universities, in schools, uh, had been told always starting from zero, uh, from scratch, from the moment when a group of uh, uh, bloodthirsty, furious uh, um, uh, peasants and citizens of France um, uh, tried to stage a coup d'etat, they uh, attacked the, the powers that be uh, in those days, they, they chopped heads off, uh, they tortured, they raped, they set fires to palaces, to villas, to archives, to libraries, uh, and they, you know, they produced this a horrible bloodbath with the guillotine running uh, 24 hours uh, and in the end they managed to uh, to gain power. If the French Revolution uh, had been told uh, for, for decades and centuries like that to all uh, to all of us well then what we, what would we think about the French Revolution? We would think that it was a, a, a very uh, dark uh, chapter and very violent and dark chapter in the history of Europe, something to be uh, forgotten. Um, but of course, of course we know that that was not the French Revolution because we know exactly what happened before that outburst of violence in France. Uh, and what had happened before was a long history of uh, terrible and gruesome oppression uh, of the people, of the peasants, of, of the laborers, um, by centuries of uh, authoritarian uh, kingdoms and, and, emperor, and, and, and kings and emperors and regimes. Uh, the brutality of the oppression was so ghastly, lasting for so long, that the only way to put a stop to it was a final rebellion. Very bloody, very violent, but a final rebellion. Now, now imagine that the current narrative about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict is told, always, it has been told for 60 years, exactly like the French Revolution in my, let's say, silly metaphor. So, uh, the narrative about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict starts from scratch, from zero. They, they tell you that, uh, and, and this is the narrative I'm, I'm summarizing, and they tell you that uh, the Jews of Europe, because of persecutions, and especially after the horrible Nazi Holocaust, they, they flocked to uh, Palestine to, to set up for themselves a safe haven. But the hostile Arabs uh, never wanted them uh, there, and they uh, were anti-Semitic, uh, very hostile, and uh, especially from the 60s onwards, they got organized into uh, terrorist groups, uh, uh, famously the, the uh, PLO of Yasser Arafat, but also other groups like the PFLP, the DFLP, Abu Abbas, and, and other people like that. 
and with the help of the hostile Arab states all around Israel, ever since the 60s they staged a number of threats, attacks, uh, wars uh, against Israel, trying to annihilate it and trying to to chuck it into the sea, as it were. Um, so Israel has always had to defend itself, and now for decades Israel has to uh, retaliate, and unfortunately, um, you know, there's a lot of collateral damage, but this collateral damage, uh, 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 like especially the, the Arab deaths, uh, are basically brought upon, the, the Arabs bring upon themselves uh, these disasters because of their staunch refusal to accept Israel, because of their hatred, uh, and they never want to make peace with Israel, and so on, and so forth. Now, uh, this is the current narrative. This current narrative misses, lacks a huge chunk of history. Uh, told like that is, is like the, the silly story of the French Revolution starting from zero, uh, from an outburst of uh, unreasonable violence. Now, of course, we've got to know, it is important that we know what happened before those days when the Arabs apparently, for no reason, uh, unreasonably in fact, uh, rose against the, the Israelis and, and ever since they tried to, to, to kill them and attack them. Now, uh, um, the, in order to understand the beginning of all this, and uh, the beginning of that huge chunk of history that is missing from the current narrative, well, in order to understand this, we've got to go back to the late uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, to an event that seems to be uh, apparently unrelated to the history of Palestine and Israel, uh, but is, it is actually very much uh, uh, the, the starting point. And that, that event is the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885. At the Berlin Conference, uh, these powers um, of those days, they uh, made a series of decisions. Uh, they, they spoke about colonization, and uh, amongst uh, other things, and uh, they decided that they had to give some sort of a legal framework to colonization. Uh, their decision was basically this. They said, uh, well, <clears throat> you know, um, if we get to a land where there is some sort of a social structure, where, is the, where there is a, a, like tribes and tr uh, tribal leaders uh, or kings or something, then we can still grab the land, but we will have to relate somehow to, to this social structure. If we get to a land where there's no such uh, political arrangement or social arrangement, then well, we can grab that land with no problem, because that land is a land of nobody. They used in those days the term, the Latin term, terra nullius, which literally means the land of nobody. And so that was the decision. Now, why is this so important? It, 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 is, it is important because the uh, early Zionist conquest, uh, colonization of Palestine uh, at, the eight, uh, at, the, at the end of the, uh, of the 19th century um, came about exactly with that kind of mentality. With the mentality that Palestine was terra nullius, was a land of no one, uh, inhabited perhaps by a few thousand savages, but nothing important. We'll see in a minute. Uh, that this is really true. Um, and so uh, you have to be very careful because um, this beginning uh, was a very uh, racist beginning. And, and the racist nature of the beginning of the colonization by the Zionists of Palestine is, is the, the one central theme which has been running through the whole of the history of Palestine in the uh, 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century up until today. The same racism that started then is present today. It is very important to understand the beginning of this racism and it begins with the terra nullius concept. Now the Zionists, uh, who were the Zionists? It's very simple, let me tell you very briefly. The Zionists were a group of thinkers, of political thinkers in Europe, Jews, of course, and uh, they uh, decided at the end of the 19th century uh, to um, give the Jews, who had been persecuted for centuries, uh, to give the Jews a safe haven. They started thinking of some sort of Jewish 
nationalism. And um, there are some important names in, 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 the, in the early Zionist movement. I'll just quote the three most important ones. Uh, Moses Hess uh, was very important because he was the right-hand man of uh, Karl Marx, uh, the famous communist Karl Marx. So uh, Moses Hess was communist and he started thinking that the Jews could uh, group up in a nation uh, around the area of the Suez Canal. Um, uh, Leon Pinsker uh, was, uh, he thought that maybe Leon, Pin Leon Pinsker is, is another uh, prominent uh, Zionist thinker of, of those days. He started thinking that, well, maybe not those areas because we have too much uh, sentimental, uh, emotional attachment to, uh, to those places uh, and we'd better go to the United States and try and create a Jewish state there. Uh, or perhaps Turkey. Uh, it's another good choice for us, Leon Pinsker said. Um, the third one, the, the most famous one of all, is uh, Theodor Health. Theodor Health, um, who will die, uh, who dies in 1904, uh, Theodor Health at the end of the 19th century thought, well, um, perhaps uh, Argentina is a good place to go. And he tried Argentina, but then, of course, all these options fell through. They were not feasible. So, at the end, Health indicated that Palestine could be a place, was the only, left, the only choice left for the Jews to create their nation. Uh, at last. Uh, so uh, the colonization started from Europe. Uh, Theodore Health set up the first uh, World Zionist Conference in uh, uh, 1897 and uh, the uh, colonization of Palestine by the Zionists, um, and I stress the Zionists, because uh, colonization of Palestine, slowly, a, sl a slow trickle of Jews had always gone to Palestine, had, al had always come to Palestine throughout the centuries. But this is a new phenomenon. It's the Zionist colonization of Palestine that starts at the end of the 19th century. And so it starts uh, with those, let's say, terrible premises. Uh, terra nullius, the land of no one. We can go there and we can get that land because Basically, there's nobody there. Um, let me quote uh, some of these most prominent uh, uh, um, Zionists uh, to give you an idea uh, of the, men the mentality I'm talking about. And be patient, because at the end of each quote in this presentation, I will uh, quote the, um, uh, the, the source. It's very important, because some of these quotations are very controversial. So we start with Israel uh, Zangwill, who in 1901 said, Palestine is a country without a people, the Jews are a people without a country. Uh, the, the source is the New Liberal Review, uh, 1901. Uh, Theodore Health, which I, I have already mentioned, said, we should there form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. And I stress the word barbarism. Uh, Theodor Health, the Jewish, the, the Jewish State, Chapter 2. Golda Meir um, was a uh, famous Prime Minister of Israel in the 60s and 70s, uh, recalling uh, the early days of Zionist colonization. She said, and I quote, it was not as though there was there was a Palestinian people in Palestine considering itself as a Palestinian people, and we came and threw them out, and took their country away from them. They did not exist. They did not exist. Golda Meir, June 15th, 1969, interview with the UK Sunday Times. And finally, Chaim Weizmann, who will become Israel's uh, first president. At the end of the 19th century, he said, uh, and I quote, the British told us that there are some hundred thousand Negroes in Palestine, and for those there is no value. Um, the quote is from Nur al-Din Masala towards the Palestinian refugees, August 2000. Uh, so this is the mentality, uh, very racist, and um, uh, the facts on the ground were not absolutely like that. Uh, the Arabs were there, they were a civilized, uh, people, uh, they were actually pleasant people, and the, 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 there are some um, very authoritative uh, 
um, uh, testimonies about this. Uh, let me quote them. Uh, and they were not barbarians at all. Uh, the great rabbi Josef Dushinsky testified at the United Nations on the 16th of July 1947 and he said, uh, literally, I quote, in the 19th century, there was never, in the 19th century, there was never any resistance by Arabs. Uh, the Jews were welcome uh, for their affluence and the knowledge they would bring to the villages. So the Jews uh, had always been welcome in, in Palestine before the start of the Zionist uh, immigration. And uh, the other, another rabbi, um, a famous rabbi, Baruch Kaplan, the head of the Yaakov Girls School in Brooklyn, um, he uh, recalls uh, uh, the Grand Rabbi of the uh, Jera Hasidim in Poland, Abraham Mordecai Alter, who wrote a letter after a trip to Palestine to check out the conditions uh, for Jewish immigration. Uh, he wrote a letter at the end of the um, uh, 19th century where he said that the Arabs are very friendly and pleasant people. So he recommended to the Jews of Europe uh, emigrating to Palestine. And, and finally, Yitzhak Epstein. Yitzhak Epstein was an early Zionist. He himself, despite being a Zionist, he himself uh, said, and I quote, there is in our beloved land uh, an entire nation which has occupied it for hundreds of years and has never thought to leave it. So uh, he admitted that there was an entire nation, an Arab nation, that has occupied it, uh, had occupied it for hundreds of years. The Hidden Question, uh, Yitzhak Epstein, 7th Zionist Congress, 1905. So, what happened? The question is, <coughs> excuse me, what happened that led from a situation where the Arabs had been living for centuries basically in peace with the Jews, uh, the Ottoman Jews, they were called, because at that time uh, those lands were under the Ottoman Empire. So what happened from a situation like that? And then, uh, you know, we went to, from that to animosity, and then clashes, and then violence, and then wars, and then the tragedy that has been unfolding for the past uh, 60 or 80 years in Palestine. So what happened is, is quite simple. Let me quote some more historical quotes, and I start with uh, one of the most famous and renowned uh, Jewish uh, humanists. Uh, his name is Ahad Ha'am. And, and I quote, he said, and what, are, uh, and what are our people doing in Palestine today? Uh, the exact opposite. They were slaves in the land of the exile, and suddenly they found themselves in the midst of unlimited freedom. Uh, this sudden change has produced in them a tendency to despotism. They treat the Arabs with hostility and cruelty, trespassing on their territory unjustly, beating them up shamefully, without any valid reason, and then boasting about it. The Truth from the Land of Israel, Ahad Ha'am, June 1891. Theodore Health, again, quote, We shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries, while denying it employment in our country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal, and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Health, Complete Diaries, edition Raphael Patai, New York. 1960. Leo Moskin, another Zionist, um, quote, Our thought is that the colonization of Palestine has to go in two directions. Jewish settlement in, in Eretz Israel, in the Great Israel, and the resettlement of the Arabs of Eretz Israel outside the country. Sefer Moskin, edition Alex Ben, uh, Jerusalem, 1939. So, it was very clear from the very beginning. The fate of the Palestinians was sealed uh, 40 years, and just remember this, was sealed 40 years before the Holocaust. The mentality was very, very obvious. Uh, an aggressive and violent, uh, arrogant immigration by European uh, Zionists uh, in Palestine, and, and the intention was to just drive the, uh, the, uh, the Arabs, the Palestinians, out of those lands, because they were, they were lands of nobody, terra nullius. Um, so we understand that, that something very, very wrong uh, started going on 40 years, let me repeat it, before the Holocaust. Um, and, of course, we are not very often told about these tragic beginnings. Uh, it's important now to add a major player 
to the scene. Uh, not just the Zionists, not just the Arabs, but the British. Because at the end of the First World War, uh, and we are talking about, the, of course, 1917-1918, uh, <coughs> The, uh, the, the British uh, uh, the, and, and other uh, uh, European nations, the French and so on, they, they won the war and, and uh, uh, they also dismantled, they, they beat, they dismantled, they defeated the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, and Britain became the power, uh, the dominant power in Palestine, precisely in Palestine. Um, at the end of the, uh, as I said, the uh, First World War. In 1920 with the Severus uh, Accords and in 1922 with the uh, League of Nations uh, mandate, Britain is established as, as the mandatory power in Palestine. Something uh, very, very tragic had happened uh, and, and tragic is not an exaggerated word, had happened just a few years before, in 1917. The British, Prime, uh, the British Foreign Minister, Arthur Balfour, um, uh, made the declaration, the famous Balc Balfour Declaration, where he said Britain is in favour of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. He said nothing of the sort about the Arabs. And that was very, very uh, tragic because the Arabs had helped uh, the British uh, uh, defeating, had helped the British defeating the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, during the First World War, and they had been promised a uh, form of self, a form of self-determination at the end of the war. Uh, the British uh, betrayed the Arabs, they, they forgot about them, at the end of the war they abandoned them, and they promised instead self-determination for the Jews, who were a tiny minority in Palestine at that time. Uh, that was actually incidentally one of the reasons why the Lawrence of Arabia, that you all know, uh, left the British army in disgust. Uh, because of this betrayal. Uh, and the betrayal of 1917 of the Balfour, Balfour Declaration is ingrained in every Palestinian. I can tell you, I was, I was in Ramallah uh, not so long ago at a, at a checkpoint uh, and I had behind me I had a, a, a Palestinian laborer uh, carrying a huge bag of tools and I turned around and I said, do you speak English? And he said a little. Uh, and I said to him, uh, do you know who uh, Balfour, Arthur Balfour is? And he said, of course. And in his broken English, he told me the whole story. He knew perfectly well. And he said to me, everybody here knows. So in 1917, there is this terrible act of betrayal by the British, who were obviously all in favor of the Jews. They were very biased toward the Jews. And, and there are facts in this direction, uh, facts to prove it. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the British helped the Jews set up the Jewish National Fund. That was the agency that uh, supervised the, uh, the, the purchase of the Palestinian land. They helped uh, the Jews set up the Jewish Agency, another agency that was coordinating the, the immigration of the Zionists from Europe. And uh, they were arming and training the Jews to form a proper army. On the contrary, any Palestinian that was caught carrying even a knife would be arrested by the British. Um, the, the, the British uh, asked the, the Palestinian farmers to repay the debts that they had uh, got uh, under the Ottoman Empire. Of course, the farmers very often could not repay those debts, and um, they were forced to, forced, forced to sell whatever they had, and even the land sometimes, if they had any land. And of course, who would they sell it to? To the Jews. Uh, and that was a ploy to force the, the Palestinians to sell property to the Jews. Um, the official language in Palestine was uh, declared, uh, one of the official languages was, was declared Yiddish, the Yiddish, the, the, the Jewish language. And the Arabs said, uh, you know, why? The, the Jews are a tiny minority in, in Palestine. Why should the Yiddish become an official language? Um, more seriously, uh, almost all public waters and public lands were awarded uh, uh, to the Jews to handle. Uh, the exploitation of the Dead, Dead Sea Salt was almost entirely awarded by the British, by the British to the Jews. Uh, the exploitation of the electricity, the, of the electricity, uh, electricity grid uh, and production of electricity was awarded to the Jews almost entirely uh, by the British. So uh, clearly the, the Arab discontent grows and grows very seriously up, up, up to the point 
Well, in 1921, we have clashes. In Jaffa, we have a massacre of Jews and a massacre of uh, Arabs. Uh, in, in Jerusalem, in 1929, another massacre of of Jews, uh, but it seems by historians have uh, seems to seem to have determined that it was large, largely due to this aggressive and arrogant behavior by the Jews themselves. Um, and the Jews also were engaging in a very odious practice. They, they, the Jewish uh, National Fund would buy uh, land from uh, Arab absentee landlords, uh, people that were not living in Palestine or even in. in they were living in the uh, surrounding uh, states uh, around Palestine. So they would buy the land from these people, but instead of keeping the Palestinian farmers to work it, to work on it, uh, they would buy the land and immediately evict the Palestinian farmers who would find themselves in utter poverty, uh, you know, in, in, uh, at a moment uh, notice. And so that was very terrible, but it was very serious, very, very odious for the Palestinians to, to have to endure that kind of destiny. They, they didn't know what was happening to them, uh, and they would be ejected from their lands, uh, which would become the property of the Jewish National Fund. They would become Jewish property to be rented or sold only to Jews and never to Arabs. Well, the British realized that the animosity was growing very fast and, and very serious, so they proposed a partition. Uh, they would say, OK, let's split, let's split the land. And they proposed a 50-50 partition, which was unfair. Of course it was unfair, because the Arabs were the great majority of the population and the Jews the, a minority. The Arabs rejected it uh, and the Jewish accepted the partition. Um, but then in, uh, in 1928, uh, when the Arabs realized that the immigration was getting worse and worse, the immigration of the Zionists was getting worse and worse, the, the, the Arabs said, okay, well, you know, rather than lose everything, we accept the 50-50 partition, which was not fair. But they accepted it. At that point, it was the Jews that rejected it. And, and a pattern is created, which we will find very often in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, in 1936, um, the situation becomes uh, so uh, grave, so un untenable, that the Arabs explode uh, in, in a national, uh, in a, in a Palestinian Arab, Arab, Arab revolt, 1936, which the British will suppress in, in blood. Uh, but, of course, the London realizes that something has to be done because uh, they cannot control the situation anymore. Uh, the injustice has been too great to the Arabs. And so they propose a new partition, the 1939 White Paper which somehow uh, is more favorable, more just to the Arabs. But at that point, the Arabs reject it, reject it uh, and for good reasons, because in the 1939 uh, White Paper, uh, there is absolutely no mention of a Palestinian self-determination, of a Palestinian nation. And the Arabs have been, have been betrayed by the British before, so they did not trust them. But uh, also, uh, as you understand by the date itself, 1939, major events are happening in Europe. The, uh, World War II is, is starting. The, in, in Germany, uh, uh, the Nazi persecution of the Jews is, 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 in, uh, is underway and is much more serious than anything ever seen before, any persecution ever seen before. So the Jews tend to obviously flock uh, out of Europe into Palestine, desperately so, uh, and rightly so, um, and the British realize that they cannot put a stop to it anyway. Uh, so, uh, you know, at, at this point, <coughs> the situation for the Brits become uh, even more serious than before, and they start considering very seriously to withdraw from Palestine. Uh, but be careful, because uh, we are talking about a period, uh, the 30s, the 1930s, in which uh, the, 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 the Zionists in Palestine had been, had been very, very busy organizing. They organized themselves in, in, in a proper army trained by the British. The proper army was called the Haganah. And they also organized themselves um, in some sort of a, a secret service uh, uh, situation. And um, a guy called Josef Weitz uh, in those days um, drew a list of Palestinian villages called the Village Files. Uh, in the 30s, this man and his aides uh, drew a, a very detailed, a very thorough list of Palestinian villages with all the inhabitants that were in them, the, 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 the chiefs, the, the tribal leaders, the muftis and everything, you know, in order to provide the Zionists uh, with a blueprint 
for the expulsion of the Palestinians, as we will see in, in a minute. That was a very infamous thing to do, uh, particularly be, be, because it came before uh, something equally, if not more, infamous that the, Nazi, uh, in, the Nazis in Germany uh, uh, would do in the 40s. The, 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 the notorious Wanzi uh, protocols, where the Nazi uh, detailed the presence of the Jews in Europe city by city, group by group, very carefully. So the, the, the Zionists had done basically the same uh, before even the Nazis did. And, uh, uh, and this was, you know, in order to uh, be more efficient for the expulsion of the Palestinians uh, from, from, uh, um, from Palestine. The, the existence of the village files has been revealed to the world by uh, the author uh, and historian, Jewish-Israeli author and historian, Ilan Pape, in his latest book, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, which I recommend because uh, it contains uh, a very, very solid piece of research on, on the events we are talking about, uh, particularly we are talking about today. Now, uh, so the, the, the Jews have been organizing in, 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 in an army, and the Haganah, but also in, in paramilitary groups. Uh, uh, which become very central at this point of the uh, uh, of this uh, of this narrative because uh, they would act in 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 a terrorist manner throughout the the the, the 30s and 40s uh, in order to complete the project of ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, but also in order to attack the British themselves. Uh, these groups were the Irgun, and after the Irgo, Irgun, the Stern group, and after the Stern group, the Palmach group. Uh, Irgun, Stern, A. Palmach were the main uh, terrorist groups uh, formed by the Zionists in those days. And as I said, they started attacking both uh, the Arabs and the, um, the, uh, the British. Why? Because the British, who had helped the Zionists a great deal, were being considered by uh, the Zionists at that point as a colonial power. They had to go away, they had to leave Palestine, because the, 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 the Zionists wanted Palestine for themselves. And so they started attacking the, 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 Brit the British as well as the Arabs. And, and let me remind you of the major uh, terrorist uh, outrages that the Zionist terrorist groups uh, carried out against the British in those days. Uh, in uh, 1944, uh, they killed Lord Moyne, the, 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 British, uh, the British minister for, for, um, uh, for the Middle East. They killed him in Cairo. They assassinated a British minister. Uh, in 1946, the Irgun, led by, led, by, uh, led by Menachem Begin, who will become prime minister in Israel, uh, blew up a, a, a portion of the, uh, the the British headquarters in in uh, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, the King David Hotel, and and they killed 90 people, and there were and there were kid kidnappings of British officers who would be executed, uh, tortured, uh, uh, terrorism on on a large scale, bombs against the British uh, uh, premises, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it, it became so. It became so serious. Uh, um, the, the Jewish um, the terrorist against the British that uh, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, uh, that everybody knows, a historical figure, um, in, uh, in 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 this period, uh, he uh, stated, and I quote, a very controversial uh, statement, and I quote. If our dreams for Zionism are to end in the smoke of an assassin's pistol and the labors for its future produce a new set of gangsters worthy of Nazi Germany, then many like myself will have to reconsider the position we have maintained so consistently and so long in the past. Even Churchill himself speaks of gangsters worthy of Nazi Germany uh, 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 addressing uh, Zionist terrorism. Uh, the quote is from the UN British Government Survey of Palestine, Volume 1. However, in this period, uh, as you know, the, uh, the Holocaust in Europe is, in, is, is uh, fully underway and, uh, uh, of course, you know, the British uh, at this point realize that they cannot stop 
uh, the desperate flood of um, uh, emigration uh, from Europe uh, by the Jews from, from Europe into Palestine. So in 1947 uh, they give up the, uh, the mandate. Uh, and they um, they will stay in Palestine until 1948, but they uh, they decide to leave. Um, but but you got to be aware of one uh, data, uh, one uh, very important, very crucial piece of information. Now, uh, <clears throat> by this time, uh, uh, by April 1948. Uh, the, the, the Jewish gangs and, and the Jewish army, the Haganah, uh, even before the start of the 1948 war uh, with the Arab states uh, for, uh, that uh, determined then the creation of the State of Israel, even before that, uh, already the Jewish army and the Jewish gangs had managed to expel, to ethnically cleanse 250,000 Palestinians from their villages, uprooting them, killing them, massacres, burning down the villages, uh, using large-scale terror uh, against the, the Arabs in order to expel them. This is very important to remember uh, because uh, then the war will come and during the war even more expulsions were carried out. Uh, the, um, the current narrative uh, will the, the current narrative uh, will uh, try and tell you at this point that yes, okay, uh, you know, violence was going on, but in the end, it's been it's been the Arabs' fault because they um, were given an opportunity by the United Nations in 1947 to partition Palestine, and they refused it. The famous uh, partition plan uh, for Palestine, UN Resolution 181 of uh, 29th of November. Uh, 29th of November 1947. Um, so the Arabs refused it and they missed a huge opportunity to have peace. Uh, this is what the current narrati narrative will tell you and it's a lie. It's one of the big uh, lies that characterizes uh, the narrative about the uh, Israeli, uh, the, the Zionist and Israeli conquest of Palestine. Um, the, the, the resolution, the partition resolution was a rip-off. Uh, nothing less than a rip-off. It was a rip-off because it was so unfair to the Arabs that they could not uh, have accepted it. Uh, let me tell you that uh, the Jews, uh, who were a minority, less than 30% of the population uh, in, in 1947, were given 56% of the land. Uh, the Arabs, who were the great majority, were given only 42% of, of the land. And that was illogical and unfair. The Negev uh, was given to the Jews, with a population of 90,000 Arab Bedouins and 600 Jews. Uh, the best port and commerce is, is so vital to an economy, everybody understands. The best port, Haifa, was given to the Jews. Uh, almost all the fertile land was given to the Jews. 80% uh, of the land uh, cultivated with wheat, wheat is very important, 80% of the land cultivated with wheat was given to the Jews. Uh, the, the Palestinians would lose the, the continuity, the, the land continuity with Syria. They had it for centuries and they would lose it. Jerusalem would be internationalized. So uh, the Arabs rejected this deal that was so clearly uh, unfair. And uh, it has to be said that Ben Gurion too, if, if one reads his diaries, uh, Ben Gurion too uh, signaled that he would not accept a deal like that, because of course the, the Zionist plan was for the whole of Palestine. We, we have seen from the very beginning uh, of the story. Let me quote uh, historically the last British High Commissioner in Palestine, Lord Alan Cunningham, who in 1948 speaks to Ben Gurion, and, uh, and this is in, in, in the British public records, and he says um, to Ben Gurion, well, you know, uh, I, I can see that the Arabs are trying to uh, uh, contain the situation, but you know, the Haganah, your army, is trying everything it can to escalate the violence. Um, the, the, the Jewish terror became so, uh, um, so evident, so undeniable, that it even reached America. Uh, the news reached America and, and it reached a number of, of uh, uh, Jewish, very prominent, very authoritative uh, figures like Albert Einstein, like Anna Arendt, uh, 
uh, and, and in the United States in 1948 already, uh, Albert Einstein and, Ar and Anna Arendt signed a, wrote and signed a letter that they published in the New York Times, uh, from which I quote literally, among the most disturbing political phenomena of our times is the emergence in the newly created state of Israel of the Freedom Party led by Menachem Begin, a political party closely akin in its organization, methods, political philosophy and social appeal to the Nazi and fascist parties. The New York Times, book section, uh, page 12, December 4th, 1948. Um, and then another very uh, prominent, and uh, let, let me remind you that Menachem Begin was also the leader of the terrorist gang, the Irgun, um, which Einstein and, and Arendt uh, 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 compare with Nazi and fascist parties. Uh, another prominent Jew of those days was one of the first ministers in, in the first uh, government of the newly created State of Israel, Aaron Chisling, who in 1948 uh, said, and I quote, now Jews too have behaved like Nazis and my entire being is shaken. Minutes of Israeli cabinet meeting, 17th of November 1948, Kibbutz Meuhat Archive, section 9. Um, so what happened? W what was happening that, you know, uh, these terrorist gangs, Jewish terrorist gangs, were so uh, uh, notorious that they were being openly called Nazi. Uh, by Jews themselves, prominent Jews themselves. Well, uh, Ilan Pape, which I mentioned before, has disclosed in his latest book that uh, Ben Gurion, uh, who was the central figure of the Zionist uh, movement in those days uh, and will become the uh, absolute leader, uh, Ben Gurion had put together a group of men, uh, a couple of uh, men, amongst which Yitzhak Rabin, who will be become Prime Minister later, Yitzhak Pundak, Moshe Dayan, Moshe Carmel, uh, Yigal Alon, Yigal Yadin, and Yosef Weitz, uh, and others, the, he put, put together this group of people who drew a plan drew out a plan for the uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine to be carried out with violent and terroristic uh, methods. The plan was called Plan D, Dalet in Hebrew. Um, now, um, it, the inspiring principles of, of, uh, uh, of this group were very graphically illustrated by Yigal Alon, uh, and I quote from uh, Ben Gurion's diary, uh, there is a need now for a strong and brutal reaction. We need to be accurate about timing, place and those we hit. If we accuse a family, Palestinian family, we need to harm them without mercy, women and children included. Uh, otherwise, this is not an effective reaction. During the operation, there is no need to distinguish between guilty and not guilty. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, massacres were uh, uh, carried out uh, in, in, in the Palestinian villages, uh, horrid deeds, like, and I quote a couple, uh, the Ain al-Zaytun al uh, village, where uh, the, the Jewish gangs uh, uh, murdered uh, in cold blood 30 children, just because a, 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 the elder, the, an elderly uh, leader of the village had challenged the Jews to treat the Arabs humanely uh, during the expulsion. Uh, he, the Jews uh, rounded up 30 of these children and they, they murdered them, um, Palestinian children, uh, in, in Daria Sin is, is, is well known, Daria Sin there was a massacre, uh, the, the Haganah uh, had made a pact with the, the villagers in Daria Sin not to attack them, uh, but, um, uh, and so they, the Haganah had to send in the Irgun and, and stern terrorist gangs who murdered around a hundred people in there. Um, a guy called, a, a Zionist called Ephraim Katsir, uh, is, on, is on the record in those days uh, with producing chemical warfare to blind the Palestinians and he even proposed it, proposed the use of it. And there was rape and looting on the large scale to the point that Benny Morris, uh, another uh, dissident historian, uh, has now, um, he uh, wrote uh, books about the, the tragedy of the Palestinians in those days. Um, uh, Benny Morris is a Jewish historian, uh, Israeli, uh, and he has written, has come up with a new book where he does something a, a bit funny. He, well, now he says 
uh, I confirm all the, the atrocity, the atrocities that I, uh, I denounced before <coughs> in my books. But, you know, uh, I, now ca I can now see that they were justified. Otherwise, Israel could not have been uh, uh, set up, uh, could not have been born. Uh, but apart from this very peculiar moral uh, somersault that he's done, uh, Benny Morris, uh, uh, describing his latest book, uh, has very recently said, my new material shows that there were far more uh, Israeli acts of massacre uh, than uh, I had previously thought. To my surprise, there were also many cases of rape. In the months of, uh, months of April, May 1948, units of the Haganah were given operational orders that stated explicitly that they were to uproot the villagers, expel them and destroy uh, the villages themselves. Uh, I quote from Survival of the Fittest by Ari Shavitz, um, Haaretz Magazine, 9th of, February, uh, 9th of January 2004. Um, and so this is um, what was going on. Uh, Jewish terror on a large, large scale. Uh, at this point, the Arab states, very late in, in 1948, in May 1948, um, decided to intervene at last. Uh, and there was the, 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 the 1948 uh, Arab-Israeli war. Uh, now, <clears throat> we have to uh, be careful about this war, because uh, this war was a big lie, again. Uh, the current narrative will tell you that the, the heroic uh, Jewish partisans, they fought against the, the hostile Arabs, and at the end of the, the, the war, they set up the State of Israel. Um, in fact, the State of Israel was born in May 1948. But, uh, uh, this is a big lie because we know from historical records that the the war was uh, was not at all uh, a, a dangerous war for the the Jews. The Jews knew very well that the Arabs uh, were very disorganized and, and poorly trained. And above all, Ben Gurion, the Zionist leader, had made a, a secret pact with the king of Transjordan, King Abdullah, uh, not to fight each other and to, at the end of the war, to partition, to divide the West Bank, uh, the West Bank between themselves. It was a huge betrayal by, by a, a, an Arab king of the Palestinian people uh, and, and the, the Transjordanian army, which was the only army that could uh, worry uh, Ben Gurion, never actually fought, uh, almost never fought in, in the war. To the point that Ben Gurion in his diary uh, 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 writes that um, and I quote, uh, and I quote from the, from the diaries: uh, the cleansing of Palestine uh, remains uh, the prime objective of Plan Dalet. And he writes it uh, in in those days. So, in other words, uh, the, the the main effort of the Jewish uh, Haganah and, and the Jewish military groups uh, was to continue the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, not certainly to fight the Arabs who were so poorly trained. But also, there was that secret pact not to fight each other with the only army that could worry uh, the Jews. Uh, Israel is born on, on, the, on the 14th of May of 1948. Uh, the ethnic cleansing uh, continues. Uh, by uh, 1949, the Jews uh, will have conquered 73% uh, of Palestine, and uh, the, the expelled Palestinians went up to 750,000. Uh, 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 that, that aside from those murdered uh, uh, and, and, and of course thousands of villages had been burnt to, to ashes and renamed with new Jewish names. Uh, the, the Jewish terror does not stop there. Uh, in, in, uh, on the 17th of September of 1948, uh, the Jews terrorist gangs uh, murdered Count Falk Bernadotte. Count Falk Bernadotte was the UN mediator, a Swedish uh, diplomat, the UN mediator in Palestine, who had been sent there by the United, by the United Nations uh, precisely because Count Bernadotte had been uh, instrumental in saving po uh, political prisoners and Jews uh, during the Second World War uh, from, uh, from the Nazis. And so he had been sent down there. And he proposed a partition uh, that was more fair to the Arabs at that point um, and the Jews uh, because of this, the Jews murdered him. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the ethnic cleansing continues. Acts of uh, 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 unspeakable terror 
by the Jews continue against the Palestinians. I will only mention one because it involves a, uh, a guy that will become very known in, in Israel, uh, a guy called Ariel Sharon, future defense minister and future prime minister. Uh, Ariel Sharon in 1953 um, will round up 69 Palestinians, women and children included, will lock them up in their houses and will blow them up uh, with dynamite. This horrid act of terrorism reached uh, America and the United uh, Nations Security Council condemned in 1953 Ariel Sharon as a terrorist with, resol with resolution 101. Uh, 24th of November 1953. Uh, and another lie they will tell you, that the current narrative will tell you about this tragedy, the Palestinian tragedy, is that the, many Palestinians left voluntarily because the Mukhtars, the Muftis, uh, uh, via radio uh, were uh, asking them to leave the villages while the Arab armies would allegedly um, uh, you know, wipe out the Israelis. Now, nothing like that ever happened. Uh, the BBC has monitored all radio transmissions during the war of 1948 uh, and, during, and during the expulsion of the Palestinians uh, and there's not one single broadcast in, in that direction. Uh, the record is kept at the British Museum in London. Anybody can check. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the Jews at this point, Israel is created and they, fi and, and they find themselves uh, in, in, in with a lot of land they now possess, which is illegally, illegally possessed, uh, illegally uh, acquired. Now, <clears throat> Uh, it's important to understand what the, the, the ploy that they will uh, uh, devise uh, at this point. Uh, of course, the, the, the Jews were slightly worried about uh, the United Nations and Western public opinion uh, because uh, there, there was a resolution, the, uh, the 1947-181 resolution, the partition, partition resolution, that still was a valid, uh, law, uh, valid resolution at that time, and there was uh, a new res resolution, the uh, 194 resolution of 11th of December 1948, which gave the Palestinians, which, which stated which stated that the Palestinians, the Palestinians, the expelled Palestinians, had the absolute right to return to their houses and to their villages. So the, 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 the Jews were slightly worried about worried about this, and um, they, um, you know, they devised a, a, a ploy called the custodianship of the land. They said, well, now we have this land and we become the custodians, all right. And so they waited until a very, very little time until the Western public opinion and Western diplomacy uh, turn uh, away from, turn, turn their attention away from Palestine, which happened very soon. Um, and, and, and after that, in 1950, uh, Israel passed the uh, law for absentee property, and after that, the law of the land of Israel, uh, and legislations that, uh, pieces of legislation that stated that the Jewish National Fund was becoming the sole, uh, the only owner of uh, that land, and of course, that land could not be sold to Arabs, could not be rented to Arabs ever again in the future only to Jews. So this is how Israel started. It's a heroic struggle, is a lie, um, and um, we are not told uh, of all the events that started with, uh, at the end of the 19th century, with the colonization, the Zionist colonization, the deception, the violence, uh, the discrimination against, the, the bias, the discrimination, um, the, 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 the double standards against the Arabs, and, and, and all the, uh, the tragic things that happen in between. We're never, almost never told about this. Um, so we cannot understand really why there is so much animosity and anger and hurt in, in the Palestinians uh, today. Let me quote a, 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 a famous rabbi, uh, dissenting rabbi. Uh, his name was uh, Leibele Weisfisch. And I quote him saying, Nazism destroyed Judaism physically. Zionism destroyed it spiritually. And I quote from, from Ur Shlonsky, Zionist ideology, the non-Jews and the state of Israel, July 24th, 2002. So deception. Uh, deception uh, is the, the dominant theme. Uh, deception by, by the Zionists, deception by, uh, in, in the, the current narrative. Deception. Deception to you who are not 
uh, told uh, of these events. Uh, deception is, in, is, is a very central theme also in another major um, development uh, in the history of Israel, which is the 1967 war. Let me, let me uh, stay two minutes on this, because uh, you have been told again that the 1967 war is uh, yet again another attempt by hostile Arabs uh, to throw Israel into the sea, uh, to annihilate Israel, and again, this is a lie. We know from recently declassified records that the situation was exactly the opposite. It was Israel that wanted to attack the Arabs because it perceived that the Arabs were weak and, and wanted to uh, conquer some more territory, which it did, in fact. And it was the Arabs, particularly the, the, the Egyptian president Nasser, that were trying to avoid the war uh, at all costs. Of course, the Arabs were posturing uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aggressive manner uh, against the moves by, uh, by Israel, but in reality, they, they wanted to avoid that war at all costs. And let me read a few historical uh, uh, quotations from declassified documents. Uh, um, I quote, President Johnson uh, recalled bluntly telling Israel Foreign Minister Abba Eben, Abba Eben um, all of our intelligence people are unanimous uh, that if the Arabs attack, you will whip hell out of them. Um, and I quote again uh, from the records, uh, the second paper Helms, Helms was the, the head of the Central Intelligence, had brought the who will win memo was, was the crucial one. It stated that Israel could defend successfully against simultaneous Arab attacks on all fronts or hold on any three fronts while mounting successfully a major offensive on the fourth. The quote is from CIA analysis of the 1967 Arab-Israeli war by David S. Robage. So the intelligence was absolutely flat that Israelis would have no problem defeating the Arabs. President Johnson knew very well. Um, from the, the, the secret, uh, the classified documents, and particularly from the Foreign Relations of the United States, Volume 19, I quote again, uh, the, uh, the American diplomat Robert Anderson saying, um, I spoke to Nasser, uh, President Nasser. He was asked specifically if he intended to begin any conflict and he said, Nasser said, to please explain to my government that he would not begin any fight, but would wait until Israelis had moved. He kept reassuring me that he was not going to uh, start a war. Uh, from the same uh, records, uh, we have uh, Nasser saying to uh, Anderson that he was prepared to send his foreign minister, Zakaria Mohedin, uh, immediately to Washington. To um, uh, Zakaria Mohedin to Washington to, uh, to tell President Johnson to try and, and calm the situation. Uh, in, at the same time, from the Foreign Relations of the United States, Volume 19, uh, we see declassified documents. Uh, that tell us that the head of the Mossad secret service, the, uh, the Israeli secret services, uh, was in Washington, 1st of June 1967, five days before the beginning, four or five days before the beginning of the war. He was in Washington having talks with uh, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara and Helms, who was the, the head of the secret services, and Mayor Amit uh, says, and I quote, Israel will win the war, and when, um, and when uh, Robert McNamara asked Mayor Amit, uh, you know, how long will it take you to win the war, Mayor Amit uh, replies, and I quote, seven days. They knew, uh, the, the secret services, and of course the, the Israeli governments knew very well that they had no problem in fighting, in fighting the Arabs, that they would win the war in seven days. They said it even before the, the, the war started, and the war lasted famously six days. Uh, Menachem Begin, uh, and I quote uh, uh, again, uh, finally, said, uh, in June 1967, we again had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai did not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. The New York Times, August 21st, 1982. So, uh, a pattern here has emerged again, lies upon lies, uh, in order to uh, uh, petrify uh, the Israelis themselves, 
uh, and in order to convince public opinion, world public opinion, that the Israelis are always in danger. I have spoken to Israelis in, in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. They told me that in 1967 they locked themselves up in, in their houses, completely petrified, convinced that a new Holocaust was just about to happen. So this is what the designers do. Uh, they tell lies in order to uh, petrify people, in, in order to, to uh, earn uh, public support. And let me uh, tell you about very recent events. This pattern has continued in time until today. Uh, the, uh, the recent onslaught by Israel in Gaza, um, December 2008, January 2009, uh, followed exactly this pattern. Let me read a quotation to you. Uh, Defense Minister, and I quote, Defense Minister Ehud Barak authorized Thursday a plan for disrupting electricity supply uh, to the Gaza Strip, as well as significantly shrinking fuel shipments. In practice, defense officials believe that the Palestinian militants will intensify their attacks in response to the sanctions, to the strangulation. As such, the real aim of this effort is to attempt a new form of escalation as a response to aggression from Gaza before Israel embarks uh, on a major military operation there. So it's clear. The Israelis were uh, trying to strangle um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, Palestinian, the Palestinians in Gaza uh, in order to achieve uh, a reaction, in order to, to, to trigger a, a Hamas reaction, in order then to have an excuse uh, to um, attack Gaza. I quote from Hamos Arel and Avi Isakrov, Hares, October 26, 26, 2007. 2007. This was uh, planned and was stated more than a year before it actually happened. So it's very clear. The plan was clear. We, we, we strangle uh, the Palestinians in order to force them to react, in order to have an excuse to tell world public opinion, oh, West, now, oh yes, now we have to attack Gaza because you know, the Palestinians have attacked us. Uh, provoking provoking um, uh, uh, attacks in order to have an excuse uh, to attack. And, and that was uh, going on, as I said, since the early days. Let me quote the early days. Uh, let me quote Moshe Dayan, the famed uh, uh, defense ministers of the 60s. He said, quote, reprisal actions are a vital lymph they make it possible for us to maintain a high level of tension among our population and in the army. Without these actions, we would have ceased to be a combative people, and without the discipline of a combative people, we are lost. We have to cry out that the, ne that the Negev is in danger, so that young men will rush there. So, uh, deception is the uh, dominant theme. Why? Well, it's very simple, as I said it already, and I repeat. Uh, to manipulate Israeli public opinion into backing one of the most unjust uh, realities, in the, realities in the modern world, the continuing ethnic cleansing and occupation of Palestine, and to do the same thing with Western public opinion that must continue to back this unjust reality, the occupation and ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Um, so, <coughs> it's the Zionist project was very clear since the beginning. Um, and let me read a few final quotes just to uh, make it very clear that the Zionist project had always wanted to, uh, to ethnically cleanse Palestine uh, and to use any means to do this. Again, Theodore Health, that as you know, said, we, we shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries while denying it employment in our own country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. David Ader, prominent Zionist, 1921, there can only be one national home in Palestine and that is a Jewish one and no equality in the partnership between Jews and Arabs but a Jewish preponderance as soon as the numbers of the race are sufficiently increased. Hayeft Commission of Inquiry, May 1921. Menachem Begin, 1947. The partition of the homeland is illegal. Jerusalem was and will forever be our capital. Uh, the great Israel uh, will be restored to the people of Israel, all of it and forever. Avishlein, The Iron Wall, 2001. Moshe Dayan, 1967. 
Let us approach them, the Palestinian refugees in the occupied territories, and say that we have no solution, that you, that, that you shall continue to live like dogs, and whoever wants can leave. Ben Gurion said that whoever approaches the Zionist problem in the moral aspect is not a Zionist. Rafi secretarial meeting in September 1967, Yossi Bailin, Mehiro Shel Ehud. It's a grab in 1992. I wish all of Gaza would fall into the sea. A report to the UN General Assembly, April 16th, 16th 1993. And finally, the very recent Prime Minister, Ehud Olmert, who in 2006 spoke of uh, a two state solution, uh, but he clearly said, I believed, and to this day still believe, in our people's eternal and historic right to this entire land. Israeli Prime Minister. Ehud Olmert addresses Congress Wednesday, May uh, 24th, 2006. In fact, since Oslo, uh, the, the famous peace accord in Oslo, the rate of settlement building of settlements building in the occupied territories went up 62%. Since Annapolis, the recent attempt at mediating peace, uh, the rate of settlements building in the occupied territories was 40 times. Uh, has, been uh, has been 40 times faster than before. Now, uh, let me end. It it's now very clear uh, why there are some Arabs who are very angry with Israel. It's now very clear that the Palestinians uh, are reacting to 80, 60 years of terrible injustice. If you consider this chunk of history, you will know that the Palestinians, although they do commit crimes, they do commit war crimes sometimes, but they are desperately trying to react to this chunk of history which has been so horribly unfair to them. So if you want uh, to, uh, to help this conflict come to an end, uh, you have to re remind people, you have to tell this part of the narrative which is missing, and, and you have to empower people by knowing all this narrative. Uh, to act meaningfully to stop the conflict. Because again, let me repeat again, the Palestinians, although they do commit crimes, but they are reacting. A reaction is a different thing from action. A, a, a reaction is not terrorism, it's a reaction. An action of terror is terrorism. And this is the reality that must be spread around. Do it. You will help the conflict come to an end. You will also help the Jewish people live in peace in the future.